good Sunday morning. My name is Jaden Jefferson and welcome to this week's Community Focus. Now my guest this morning was scheduled to be Councilwoman Michelle Grimm, but she had to reschedule. So this morning I'm airing my extended conversation with Daniel Ortiz, a Democratic candidate running for state representative in Ohio's 43rd House District. It's a district that includes the Reynolds Corners, Ottawa Hills, Old West End, and even some South Toledo communities. In this interview, you'll hear Ortiz's response to some campaign mail that was sent out by his Democratic opponent, Councilwoman Grimm, which is being strongly rebuked by many. The first thing was confusion, honestly, and I think that's because the way that they are worded, uh, it is strongly meant to imply that I had some sort of position of power or authority and took a vote uh, that had, you know, a lot more sway than I did just as a private citizen. Um, I cast the same vote that tens of thousands of people did in Toledo on these issues. And, um, you know, that, that was my first thought was I was, I was confused. I couldn't understand what the point that they were trying to make was with, with the mailers. And then as I took a closer look at them, uh, you know, it was, it was just pretty, it was shocking and it was pretty upsetting to have your name and face on a big, you know, six by 11 postcard with a picture of a house burning down. Um, you know, that is, that is exactly the kind of um, imagery and tactics that we often see uh, Republicans use against Democrats. And so I just, I couldn't, I, I really, I really couldn't believe it uh, when I saw it. And it seemed kind of abrupt because considering you worked on Michelle's campaign for city council a while back, it just seemed like it was something that just happened. Like there was a quick turnaround. So has there been a history of, you guys, you know, not agreeing on things or, you know, having trouble? Um, not not from my perspective. And, you know, you would have to ask her campaign how they feel. But, you know, obviously it's, it's awkward um, running against, a, first off, running in a primary at all. Um, and then running against someone who you just worked for. But this was a, this is like an unprecedented year with the redistricting. And so basically what happened is we both had launched our campaigns um when the maps still weren't final and you know we would talk and and she said multiple times like i hope we're not drawn into drawn in against each other and i felt the same way and um so then just by the time the maps came out i don't know what their feeling was uh but for me i just kind of felt you know it had been too far gone to drop out now there was never a conversation about that with them. Um, I would have sat down and had a conversation, but, um, you know, at that point I had already raised a decent chunk of money. And, you know, that first stage of raising money for a campaign is asking your family and friends and I have a working class family. Everyone I interact with in my daily life is, you know, works for everything they have. So it's not like I had some uh, rich aunt or uncle that I could ask for $5,000, you know, um, it was asking all of my friends and family to chip in 25, 50, 100 bucks. And so I, I didn't really want to just turn around to them and say, okay, never mind, I'm out. Um, and so then, you know, the campaign that I think both of us have ran so far, um, you know, she's campaigning on her experience and her background and her, um, you know, her education, all that, all those things. And, and she has an impressive resume and she has a lot of experience in policy work and, I've been running kind of the same way I ran last year for city council as just like, Hey, uh, I'm just kind of a regular working member of the community like you. And I think that if you elect me, you know, that I'm going to make decisions kind of the way that you would make decisions. I am thinking about things through a practical lens as a working person. I mean, I'm talking to you right now in my scrubs on my lunch break at work, you know? And so it's just like my, that's kind of always been my thing is like, I hope that you see yourself in me and know that you can kind of trust me to make decisions that, um, I'm, I'm not thinking about politics. I'm not thinking about like the party line and, you know, whatever else or whatever is going to get me reelected or elected. I, I, I want to do <clears throat> what I think is right. I might not always make the right decision. Right. Um, but I'm always doing it with the best intention in mind. So yeah, it was, it was, it seemed very abrupt because neither of us, honestly, if you go through either of our campaign presence uh, so far, you're not even seeing much reference that we even are running against each other or have a primary. I never talk about my opponent. You can search, uh, you can search my Twitter for the word opponent. <clears throat> and I didn't bring it up until the campaign finance reports came out and just compared, you know, how I did versus my opponent. And uh, I've just always been asking people to vote for me, 
not asking them to go against Michelle, you know. And Michelle had made a comment in a post Facebook post she recently deleted saying that you had made passive aggressive comments. Do you know what she's referencing, whether this has been through the media or because she seemed insistent that there were some passive aggressive yeah. comments that were made? I'm not sure exactly what she is referring to. Um, you know, when you're running in a primary against each other, against someone who shares a lot of the same values, you know, it's this isn't even like the classic um, center left versus a progressive. Like Michelle and I are both progressive candidates um, on, on the issues. Like I, we agree on a lot of things. So you have to draw contrasts and she uh, draws a lot of contrasts about her experience uh, in government work. And you know, those little like snips back and forth, I, I understand how that, you know, she said things that I've taken, you know, a little umbrage to or whatever, but nothing that's worth mentioning right now. And, you know, all the way up until Saturday morning, thinking about anything that either of us had said that could be insinuated as, you know, and snipping at each other, it all seemed like things that could be smoothed out with that post-election phone call, right? Um, <laughs> Friday night, it's Friday night. I was knocking doors in the Devo neighborhood and I knocked on the door and this person answered and they had said, Oh, I was just reading about you. I said, where were you reading about me? And they said, I was looking at my sample ballot. So I decided to look up both candidates and I was on your website and I was on council member Grimm's website. And, and this person was like, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. I think you both sound really good. You're both aligned with my values. So I made my pitch on why I thought uh, that this person should vote for me. And honestly, like they weren't, it didn't like move the needle really. They still seemed like they were on the fence. And I said, you know what? At the end of the day, like the, the only wrong decision you can make in this election is voting for the Republican. Like I, Michelle and I are like two different styles, but we're both going to be good representatives. I think we're both good people. We both have our hearts in the right place. So, you know, choose your adventure. And is there anything else you want to add about this matter? Oh, uh, I am extremely done talking about it. <laughs> uh, I, I, of course, uh, you know, I'm not going to turn down an, an opportunity to, to sit and chat with you and, and do an interview. But, uh, you know, this, I, in my opinion, this, this, uh, hopefully this kind of puts a bow on it because we've, uh, we're what, four or five days until election day. Uh, I think both campaigns need to use all of their energy to go out and get people out to vote because that is what is most important. Um you know, getting past past voting history is the biggest indicator that someone is going to vote again. And there's no doubt that because because we have a competitive primary, we are getting more people to vote than would have voted if there wasn't a competitive primary. And especially one where you have two good campaigns that are going to go turn people out. Like there are people I know that there are people that are going to come vote for me and probably for Michelle that have never voted in a state legislative primary before. Right. Um, I know that for a fact because I, you know, I've seen my friends voting records and they only voted in the presidential years until I started getting involved. Right. So, um, uh, that's, that's gotta be our focus. And, uh, at the end of the day, like, it's really unfortunate how this last week or five days, whatever it's been, feels like a year to me, um, how this is transpired like the rhetoric being used. Now Ortiz is a pharmacy technician right here in Toledo and believes that his experiences as an average person with no political experience could prove to be helpful in making decisions for the people of Ohio's 43rd House District. Now here's a quick reminder that the primary election is Tuesday. Those local races are just as important as any national race. And that is this week's Community Focus. Have a great Sunday.